Hello everyone, this is Al Fadi and I'd like to welcome you to one of our live streams. In fact, this one is going to be a live stream on Facebook, a live stream on our YouTube channel, Sierra International, and also it's going to be a radio show, which is uh, my radio show, my podcast called Let Us Reason. Because the podcast is usually 24 to 25 minutes long, yet this live stream will be at least one hour, we are going to do two segments. Some of you are used to that already. So you'll notice that after 24, 25 minutes, I'm going to conclude the first podcast. We'll take about a few minutes break. We'll correspond with your comments and questions, and then we'll come back again and do episode two for the podcast as well, as we will remain live on Facebook and YouTube. Um, I'm excited, of course, that uh, you're joining us. And by the way, we apologize. We tried our best to try to uh, announced this one for some reason it didn't work out however um, I want to just remind everyone that we will be coming back live at 5 p.m. New York time with that says I want to welcome all of you to our let us reason also podcast this is Al Fadi and of course this is our let us reason usual live stream with me here in studio is our dear brother Jay Smith Jay Welcome back, and uh, it's been really a while since we did one of those. Well, I think it was about eight or months or nine months ago that we did our last live stream together. Right. At, at here in uh, That's the correct. studio, but we've That's done correct. some uh, on Zoom uh, and on. That's correct. From your home and my home on the other on the opposite sides of the continent. That's correct. So, um, Jay, why don't you give people an idea about why uh, are you here this time and what is it that we're doing by way of a, a video series? Okay, it's been, uh, if you take a look at these books that I have uh, here in front of us, it's all to do with these books. These are seven, actually there's eight there if you look at the blue one at the top, but those are eight different Arab Qurans. Not one of them is exactly alike. And we've always heard that there is only one Quran, and this is what you've grown up with, is it not? That's correct. That's correct. And that's when something that every Muslim, I've been doing this for almost 40 years, I've only ever heard that there is only one Quran that is completely preserved, that it's guarded uh, by Allah himself in chapter 15, verse 9. It says that. And so any Muslim who's grown up in the Muslim world, as they would have, they would have come up with that narrative. That's the only narrative we have. That's the only narrative that we as Christians and also secularists, so those of us who have gotten it or received it from the Muslims, that's the only ever narrative that we've ever been taught. And so we've always assumed that this is that Quran. This is it, the blue one, the little blue one here that I have here. This is known as the Hafs Quran. Well, there was a famous interview, or, you know, or uh, I might say disastrous interview that happened about two and a half months ago on June 8th of this year, 2020, where Muhammad Hijab, he's from England, uh, he is, used to come down to Speaker's Corner all the time. Uh, he, I've known him, we've engaged back and forth for quite a few years when I was there at Speaker's Corner. And he was in the crowd back in 2016 when Hattun Tash, my colleague, who had gone around the Arab-speaking world to different countries. She didn't do it on her own. She had people that did it for her and started collecting Arabic Qurans that differ. And what do we mean by differ? Because uh, there are some Muslims here uh, that uh, they have some compliments to you and I. They think we're clowns. So why don't we let them know what is the difference between these uh, Qurans? Yeah, these are known as Qirar or Ahruf, that these are... The, uh, differences the, 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 uh, that have to do with dots and vowels. Right. So five dots, three vowels. And the five dots did not exist when the Quran supposedly, or they were going to refute that in just a month or two, uh, that the Quran existed at the time of the 7th century. When, they, when it was introduced in the Arabic at that time, the Arabic did, could not accommodate reading it because it did not have distinctions between many of the letters. And as you know, there were only about 16 letters at that time. Uh, they, they needed to find some type of way to distinguish between the letters, and so they had That's to right. introduce these dots. Somewhere in the early 8th century, late 8th century, then they were canonized by the 9th century. Three more vowels were then added to it. That's the Dhamma, the Qasr, and the Fatah. And by yeah. that time, then, they had all kinds of different Muslims between, and I, I want to talk about the 8th to 10th century, so between the 8th and 10th century, between 736 and 905. That's the dates we're looking at. Between 736 and 905, you had about 30 different Qurans that were chosen, all of them differing because of where they placed these dots and where they placed these vowels. 
That's wonderful. And again, I want to welcome, of course, uh, those of you who are uh, watching our live stream, Let Us Reason, and also our podcast, Let Us Reason. I see some of you uh, saying that there was notification from YouTube. You probably missed my introduction. We tried to announce this, uh, the proper channel, but didn't work. So we wanted to go live anyway. Hopefully, you guys can mark on your calendar that today we'll be back again live at 5 p.m. New York Times. So, Jay, what is the Islamic presupposition when it comes to the issue of the preservation of the Quran, the Qiraat, and so on and so yeah. forth? Well, Muslims today are kind of hang tied. They don't really, they, they can't go right or left on this because the difficulty concerns the Quran itself. In the Quran, in this book, let's just use this one here since this is the one that is the official Quran today. This is the Hafs text. When you look at chapter 85, verse 22, it's very clear that the Quran is eternally preserved on these tablets that exist in heaven. Therefore, it has never been created. It is the uncreated Quran. That's the first problem. And that's endemic to the Quran because it's based in on the Quranic verse. Right. Secondly, that this preserved Quran was then sent down piecemeal over a period of 22 years or 23 years between 610 and 632 to a man named Muhammad, both in Mecca and Medina and that it cannot be changed by any human hands. That's in chapter 10, verse 15. That's in chapter 18, verse 27. Very clear. No human can change the Quran. Why can it not be changed? Because of chapter 15, verse 9, which underlines the fact that Allah guards it. Allah guards it from corruption. So he preserves it. So if you have these injunctions endemic or into, included in the Quran itself, then you can see for Muslims they have to adhere to that, they have to obey that, and so they're hang tied by it because that means this book here has always existed. There is no, um, uh, there is no human intervention, there is no human in manipulation. So that the scholars today have been saying, people like Dr. Yasser Qadi and Sh Dr. Shabir Ali, two of the Western scholars here in North America, have said very clearly that this book is exactly the same as all the Qurans that have existed for the last 1400 years, this is exactly the same. And what I'm saying the exact same, I'm not talking about the English translation, I'm talking about the Arabic. Mm -hmm. That the Arabic is word for word, letter for letter, not just word, but letter for letter. Some even say diacritical mark for diacritical mark, but let's throw that out for now that's because right. that's ridiculous. Certainly, word for word, letter for letter, that's what Dr. Yasser Qadi has been saying, Shabir Ali has been saying. I've known Shabir Ali since 1997. We've done six debates together. He has always made that claim that every Quran in the world is exactly the same as the Quran that was revealed to Muhammad between 610 and 632 that was canonized by Uthman in 652, 1400 years ago word for word, letter for letter, the exact same, and that all the manuscripts, and that, that includes the top copy, the Samarkand, the Ma'il, the Petropolitanus, the Husseini manuscript, and the Sana'a manuscript, those six major manuscripts, the St. Petersburg manuscripts, the Doha manuscript, all of them are exactly the same. They used to say that they were complete. Now they've quickly pulled back from doing that, but there is no difference between those manuscripts and the Quran we have today. Now that's, they, because they're forced to say that, Nobody's ever checked them out on it. There's no way that we could check them out on it because nobody had taken this seriously until the last 10 years. And in the last 10 years, well, actually it started in 2002, so we're talking about the last 18 years, you had two scholars, Dr. Tayyip Altukulic and Dr. Ekmel Nisanlu, both Muslim scholars, Turkish scholars, who decided to go and look at the six major manuscripts that I just referred to. And they started, and they wanted to look and see whether or not, first of all, that they were from the time of Uthman. Were they from the time uh, mid 7th century, 652, that Uthman was in power when he supposedly created that first Quran. They disputed that, they dispelled that pr pretty quickly. You could see that none of these manuscripts are that early. Yep. That they really got introduced in the 8th century, 9th century. But then they wanted to find out how, whether or not they were complete. None of them are complete at all. And then the most disturbing part is were there differences? Were there changes? And they found that in every case there were changes, there were differences. Now that's the skeletal text, that's just the skeletal text. And I remember having this debate with Dr. Shabir Ali back in 2014, that's six years ago, when I introduced Alta Kulic and Ekmel and Sanlu's material to them, to him, along with Dr. Dan Brubaker's material on the variants. And at that time he found skeletal variants, these are continental variants, he found about 800 of them. 
there right. for his doctoral thesis that he had just finished in 2014. And at that time, Shabbat Ali didn't know what to do. All he could say was, well, I believe it, I entrust it because of the miracle of the number 19, the miracle of the number 19. And he talked about these set of verses versus this set of verses, you get number 19. You get these words with this word, you get 19, 19, 19. He spent 19 minutes wasting our time. And I remember getting up and asking him, what verses are you talking about? None of these manuscripts have verses. What Quran are you talking about? They're not even complete. Where is this number 19 you're referring to? He finally had to admit that it was the 1924 Huff's text, this book right here. This is the 1924 Huff's text. Now, what since then, we then found a lot of diacritical variants, and we found a lot of vowelization variants, and these are the ones that Hatun Tosh has come up with. And she did it by accident. She came upon it by just going into a store and asking for a Quran and being told that, well, which Quran do you want? Ask the Quran, which Quran are you talking about? She had no idea. Being a, from, come from a Muslim background herself, she had never heard this before, that there was more than one Quran that you could read today in the 20th century, or now in the 21st century. And so she took whatever she could, brought it back to London, we looked at it, and we, of course, we, I knew about this because I'd been studied about it. We had been told about this back in the 1990s when I was a study under, uh, under Dr. Dudley Woodbury. And so we knew that they, of these, get us, I just didn't know they still existed. I thought they'd all been dumped into the Nile River back in 1924 by uh, the, the Muhammad ibn al Husayni al Haddad when they came across and they made this a canonical text. Barry, the Huffs, Carter, basically. The Huffs, the text. Uh, right. The other 29, th I assume that they had been th thrown into the river. So it was fascinating to find that these existed. So we found them, we got them. I, I didn't get them. Hatun got them, found them, and we took them down to Speaker's Corner in 2016, four years ago. And we held them up. That's all we had to do. We only needed to hold them up and film us holding them up four years ago, and that caused the damage right there. And uh, because there was Muhammad Hijab in the crowd looking at us, seeing what we were holding up, and calling all the Muslims to leave the corner. Leave us. Do not watch what they're showing you. Do not listen to what they were saying. He did not want them to watch us. He did not want them to hear us. That was four years ago. Well, let's now jump to June 8th this year, just two and a half months ago. He then comes to Yasser Qadi and asks the question. He should have asked us and should have listened to us. We were talking about it. We were showing the differences back there in 2016. So he asked Yasser Qadi this. Which one of these Qurans, which one of the Qurans is the one that was revealed to Muhammad? Which is this? Which one of these Qurans exists in heaven? Which of these Qira'at exists in heaven? Which is kind of a misnomer by, by, because Qira'at by definition requires dots and vowels. There were no dots and vowels in the 7th century. So you can see he should be asking another question about that, but he wanted to know which one of these is the one from the time of Uthman. Well, here's the problem. None of them are from the time of Uthman. As we're gonna find out, none of them are from the time of Muhammad. And none of them could have existed in heaven because the Kira'at by definition only begins to be introduced in the eighth century. That's right. Uthman is in 652, mid seventh century. And we are gonna visit this in a second. Again, I wanna welcome everyone who's with us here, by the way. This is the usual Let Us Reason live stream, but also it is my podcast, Let Us Reason. With me here is Dr. Jay Smith. And we're talking about the, uh, what, what I love your title, uh, the Qira'at Conundrum, uh, which basically the problem with the Ahruf and Qira'at of the Quran. I want to welcome, of course, I see some of the moderators here. First and last, thank you. And Jai, first and last, and Jai, uh, please keep an eye on the side discussions about the NIV and the King James. Maybe these guys came to the wrong live stream because we're talking about the Quran, not King James, neither the NIV. <laughs> And if you are a moderator, please bump him out. I don't need this kind of distractions right now. So let us focus on what is important. So what is the presupposition you're coming from? Okay, and this is something that, I, that I'm, and I'm saying this to not just Muslims, I'm also saying this to Christians, I'm saying this to atheists, I'm saying this to humanists, I'm saying this to anybody who is interested in Islam. You've got to be careful of the presupposition you start with, remember. We have only been told one narrative. In all of our schooling, in all of our seminary, Bible school, you name it, uh, 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 secular schools, we have been told that this book, this book, was revealed to Muhammad between 610 and 632. Where did we get that from? Where did that come from? Did the Muslims just make it up? No, they didn't just make it up. This was written by al-Buhari, who died in 870. Muhammad died in 632. 870 to 632, you're talking about 240 years after the fact. You have this reference, and it's in chapter, uh, it's in volume uh, six, chapter, well, actually volume six, book 61, but that's hadith right. number 509 and 510. You, right. And that's where Muslims have to go to, to find out how the about the story about the creation of the Quran. So you've got to go to Al-Buhari. Which is Al 240 years later. 240 years later. The question I'd like to ask is, why isn't this from the time of Muhammad? That's right. 
if this did happen in the time, why didn't someone write it down? Why isn't the Quran itself testifying about that? Oh, that's interesting. It doesn't testify to itself. But what we do know is that every Muslim and every person that's watching us right now can only go to that reference to know how the Quran was put together. And what it says at that time uh, was that when Muhammad died, there was no Quran written down. It was a crown, but it had not been written down in 632. Not in a codex form, not in a form like you see here. It had been memorized by many of the companions at the Battle of Yamama and between 632 and 634, 70 of these uh, who had memorized the Quran were killed, which caused a crisis. Remember, I hear Muslims saying all the time, we don't need any manuscript. We don't nothing. We need anything written down. We memorize it. No, you didn't. If 70 dying caused the crisis, so much so that Abu Bakr had to bring in Zaid ibn Thabit, the secretary of Muhammad, what do secretaries do? They write. They write down what the, their, their employer wants them to write. Zaid ibn Thabit was a secretary of Muhammad. They said, you are the one that's responsible. We've got to get this written down. But he was troubled by the request. He didn't want to do it. Because he said, why can I do something that the prophet didn't do? That's right. They said, nonetheless, it's a good thing to do. So he finally relented, and then he went to all the remaining uh, sahaba, those who had memorized it. He took it from them. He took it from pieces of uh, bark. He took it from bones, stones. He took it from any place he could, and he created that first Quran. He first, that was the first one written down. He gives that to Abu Bakr, who gives it to Umar, who gives it to his daughter Hafsa, who had been a wife of Muhammad, and she stuck it under her bed. What an idiotic thing to do. Why would you put something that is the greatest revelation in the history of mankind, the only one written down, why would you stick it under your bed? Obviously, it wasn't very important to her. So, what happens? It sits under the bed. Meanwhile, 20 years later, let's go now 20 years, and let's go now to volume 6, hadith number 510. 20 years later, we're now in 652, and Uthman is now in power, and he sends a group of Muslims from Medina and Mecca up to the north. He sends them up to Azerbaijan. And they're fighting against the Azerbaijanis, but they're fighting alongside some Muslims who come from Iraq, Kufa, and Basa, and others who come from Syria, Damascus. In Damascus, exactly. And they're there fighting together. After they fight, they go to the mosque, and they suddenly hear each other reciting the Quran. And these Meccans and Medinans say, hold on a minute, that's not the Quran. You are, you are reciting something that we never <laughs> heard. And they came to blows, back and forth. So Hudaifa who is the man that's up there, he comes back down to Medina, he goes to, he goes to uh, Uthman, and this is now Al-Buhari again, volume six, hadith number 510, and he says to, to Uthman, we've got to do something, we do not want to do, we want, do not want to happen what happened uh, for the Jews and Christians, we need to make sure that we have one Quran, only one Quran, and this Quran must be in the Qureshi dialect. And you know, I'm, I'm laughing as you're saying this because I thought Shabir Ali says that Muslims never quarrel over this. <laughs> they quarreled enormously. And that's why Hudaifa had uh, Uthman bring Zaid ibn Thabi out of retirement again, it's 20 years later, and asked him to go get that copy from Hafsa that's still under her bed. If they, had, if they had only made copies of it at that time, they would have not had this problem. So he has them bring that to them, and along with three others that he appoints, he says, I want you to write it in the Qureshi dialect. What's that mean? What's this Qureshi dialect? Well, that's supposedly the dialect of the tribe of Quraysh, which is the dialect of Muhammad. Okay, so this is the dialect that existed in, in the Mecca, Hijaz. In Mecca. Mecca and Medina, that central part of Arabia. Uh, primarily Mecca, at least. Okay, so yeah. it would have to be in that area. Now, if that yeah. is the case, he writes it in the Qureshi dialect. What does he do next? According to Al-Buhari, volume 6, hadith number 510, he takes all the other recitations. Now, Shabir Ali keeps on saying this is recitation. This is nothing more than oral recitations. And he burns them. How do you burn oral recitations? Exactly. How do you burn? Oral... How do you burn someone's lips? You burn their tongue? <laughs> Something is written. <laughs> it has to be written down. There has to and, be parchment. And we know it has to be written because one of those who stood against uh, the, the whole process was um, uh, Ibn Mas'ud, who has his own codex. And where is he from? He is also from the same region. From he the is same from area. Kufa which is just southwest of today, Baghdad. I mean, that's his reading is popular there. And then, yeah. who else do we know? Ubay ibn Kab, who's even more famous, Ubay ibn Kab, who has 116 surahs, that's right. not 114. Ibn Masud has either 110 to 111, depending on who you're gonna to listen to, because they can't even agree. So you can see he's missing the cha first chapter, he's missing chapter 113, and he's missing chapter 114. So it's not the same Quran. In other words, they became popular in Kufa and they became popular up in Damascus. If that is the case then, then you're already seeing a multiplicity of Qurans and you can then understand why they, they had to make it into one Quran. They burned manuscripts. If you're gonna burn something, they have to be manuscripts, they have to be parchment, they have to be vellum. So obviously Qurans were then burned and destroyed by Uthman. And this is what Muslims do. Whenever something disagrees, they destroy it. Yeah, they did it in Uthman's time. They did it in the 1924 time. 
and uh, they're doing it again. They're still doing it again now. Yeah. They delete it off the internet. That's right. They have something they don't want to be there. That's right. And that's what Yasser Qadi did, and that's what uh, Mohammed Hijab did just about two weeks ago. So here we go. We're back in 652. He then makes this one final Quran. And what does he do with that one final Quran? This is the Qureshi Quran. Destroys all the other dialects, destroys all the other recitations, if you want to call them, but they're actually written text. And then he sends these out to five cities. And the five cities are Mecca, Medina, Kufa, Basra, and Damascus. So two of them are in Iraq. One is up in Damascus, and the other two are in the Hejaz. He sends a reciter with every one of them, a reader with every one of them, to make sure that nobody else writes any other dialect just to ensure that. That's in the seventh century, right? That takes place in the seventh century. What happens in the eighth century? And here's where it really gets juicy. That's right. In the eighth century, suddenly, these new uh, Qurans start to appear. Take a look at what we have right in front of us. That's right, different Qurat. I mean, I thought he burned everything. In fact, Islam Critique, thanks you, brother, for bringing that up. He said, you know, uh, the uh, parchment and leather would have been so expensive at the time of Uthman. Why would he burn it rather than just wash it off? Wash it off and right over top of it. Exactly. Why don't you just do that? I want you to look at this one. What's it say right there at the top? Qirat, what is it? Qirat ibn Amir. Ibn Amir. Right. What's the date that you have on the back there? The date is uh, 736. 736 AD. When did Muhammad die? Uh, 632. So 632. this is about 100 and some, you know, after his death. Okay, so you're talking about 80, 50, 70 to 80 years after his death. Right. This then appears. This is the earliest of all the Qira'at Qur'ans. From Damascus. From Damascus. Not from Medina. Interesting. Not from Mecca. It is from Damascus. It is from the very area that he that Uthman had destroyed, right? And yet this is the earliest one. This, this I just got two weeks ago. You can buy these on the internet, folks. You can buy them, get them. To prove that these exist still in the 21st century, a thousand years later, you can still use these books. You can still get them, and you can unpack them. So there's Ibn Amr, Amr, as you say it. Ibn Amr, yes. That's 736. And That's then correct. we have Ibn That's Kathir. Correct. Let me see if I, I think I have, yep, I have Ibn Kathir right here. Now, Ibn Kathir, Ibn Kathir is 738. Doesn't it say right there, Ibn Kathir? It does. Okay. And it's interesting uh, why Ibn Kathir is, uh, is uh, fascinating to me because he is from Mecca. He is from Mecca. So if there's any Quraysh dialect, this should be it, right? He should be the one who's recorded it. He should be the one, right? That's right. And yet, why isn't his chosen? No. Because... I mean, in fact, you don't know anything about his reading, by the way. In fact, if you mentioned any Muslim right now, do you know about the reading of Ibn Kathir? You know whom they're going to think about? Ibn Kathir the, of the 13th century, right. the thinking, commentator. He's think, they're, they're, they're thinking of the tafsir that's of right. Ibn Kathir. And that's why even Yasakadi had to remind people we're not talking about that. We're talking about the Qira'at of Ibn Kathir. That's from, right. From, that's right. Okay, so he is from the Hijaz area. So he would be from Mecca. This would be the Qureshi dialect. That's correct. If there was any dialect that would be, uh, uh, that would be, let's just call it canonical. This should be it. If I'm, uh, if I'm getting it right. So this happens in 736 for him, and in 738, this continues. We then have, uh, we have Kasai, we have uh, Asim, we have Hamza. Uh, we have Ibn Amr. So we're talking about seven now, yeah, and we have Ibn Nafis. Amr, and there is Ibn Amr. So Ibn Amr and then also Nafi. So now we have seven. These are the seven. All and right. they go from 736 all the way up to 905. 736. Folks, pay attention to the dates. Look at the dates. You know, Muhammad Sorry, 736 died 736 up to 805. Let me right. correct myself. You know, so, so about 200 years. Uh, you, you see what's going on here. That's fascinating, by the way. We're going to wrap up our uh, first uh, segment, but I want to remind people of something. You know, our dear brother has been investing a lot of time doing his historical criticism. Uh, he talks about the Petra, he talks about the Qibla, he talks about a number of things that contradict the traditional presuppositional view that we, grown up as Muslim, we now grow up believing in. And all of a sudden now we're starting to look at the Qiraat and there is something suspicious going on here. They all lead also into that 200 year gap. And if we look at Ibn Amr, came from Damascus, which is the same area where we have Petra. And we have also the Umayyads and so on and so forth. But that will be for a different show, possibly, or series. Are we going to continue or are we going to stop here for a while? Well, we are going to stop in the next two minutes. So any, anything you want to okay, so wrap up. Okay, so let's just look at them this. real quickly. Yeah. Nafi, Ibn Kathir, Abu Amr, Ibn Amir, As, Asim, Hamza, and Kasai. How many do I have? Seven. Seven. These are the seven 
that supposedly are the Holy Seven. Who chose these seven? Ibn Mujahid. And when did he die? 936. 300 plus years. 300 years after Muhammad, these seven are chosen. These are the seven that every Muslim talks about. Now, let me ask you something. Whenever you talk to a Muslim, and I'm going to ask you Muslims in this case, whenever you hear about these seven, you are always been told by your authorities that these seven are the same seven that Jibril was introduced to Muhammad before he died in 632. Yep, that's, uh, uh, folks, let me wrap up by saying, and while we're closing uh, this segment, this is, by the way, part of my podcast that is also known as Let Us Reason. What uh, Jay is talking about is that Omar ibn al-Khattab was surprised to discover that the Quran was revealed by Jibreel to Muhammad in seven different modes, seven different dialects, if you wish, ahruf, because he caught someone in the mosque praying and reciting the Quran different than his recitation. And that uh, gentleman, Hisham, is basically from Quraysh, from the same tribe as Omar. To his surprise, the Prophet of Islam says, oh yeah, it was revealed to me in those seven different Ahruf. That's what Jay is talking about. So I'm going to leave you with this. We're going to take a few minutes pause. We'll interact with your comments. You can still see us live, but we will come back again and start official recording a couple of minutes from now for part two of this podcast, Let Us Reason. So thank you again for all of you to come in on the show in such a short notice. We apologize. We've been trying for two hours now to try to announce it to you. So if we are not successful to announce the next one, I just want you to be aware of this. Moderators, pay attention to this, please. 5 p.m. New York time, Eastern time. 5 p.m. New York time, Eastern time, which is um, considered to be, I believe, 10 o'clock in London, UK time. We will be doing a second also set of these live streams on podcast. So thank you for joining us. Until we see you in a few minutes, God bless you. Okay, so uh, let's look at this. Hey, Islam Critique, thanks, man. Uh, you're you're a, a generous giver. You know, don't give this guy. Just keep giving here. And uh, I've not got a cent from Islam. One, one from day, Islam one day, ever. I'll pay for you, man, and you'll finish your d uh, degree and get a PhD. <laughs> <laughs> no, Islam Critique gives me lots of other material. I don't need money from him. I just need his. I need his mind and his brain and his. His eloquence. Yeah, and Sister Gedalia, I'm, I'm, I'm pleased to see you here. Uh, I left you, by the way, a PM message. Uh, hopefully you read it, but uh, I really need your help. First and last, need your help. And Jai, why don't you send me, uh, brother, your uh, link to YouTube so we can make you a moderator as well. So Jay, um, uh, let's let's see, folks, if there is any questions for us in particular uh, before we start the next uh, segment. Uh, if you guys saw any questions, please let us know. Uh, I know you, you've been able to uh, track some of those. Um, praise the Lord, there's a lot of interactions with us right here. Uh, here's a question. How long do you think the cult of Islam will be finished? Uh, we don't know. <laughs> we don't know. I mean, now uh, our care is not about finishing, uh, you know. Give Jay this $10. <laughs> so you owe me $10. <laughs> you can make you can buy me some coffee this afternoon. Islam critique. I do not like your approach. <laughs> he feels guilty. Uh, no problem. Well, really, folks, it's not about finishing a cult. It's about rescuing those who follow that cult, and that's our Muslim friends. We want them to know the Lord, and this is really what we're doing. And we're asking just logical questions, logical questions. Uh, to help people just realize what's going on. Renee, thank you so much, by the way. I would like to also add you to the list of those moderators. Send me as well your link. So all that to say, Jay, is uh, that maybe we can start part two right now, and mm -hmm. we will begin to continue with uh, telling people about the show that we are doing concerning the Qiraat. With that said, let me see what's going on here. I think uh, my screen went into a frozen, <laughs> uh, basically, uh, mode. And uh, we'll take it from here. All right. So, folks, we're going to be starting our second segment of our podcast, Let Us Reason. I'd like to welcome those of you who are joining us uh, uh, through the Let Us Reason po podcast. But also, I want to welcome all of you back to our YouTube and Facebook live stream, Let Us Reason, as well. Now you know why I use Let Us Reason, because I have a whole bunch of video series, podcasts, and live streams all under the same umbrella of Let Us Reason. Last segment, we talked, myself and Dr. Jay Smith, who is with me here in studio in person. Uh, believe me, it's not virtual. It is in person. Uh, we've been talking about the so-called, and, and that's his title, and I, I love that title, the Qira'at Conundrum. 
And we are so thankful, by the way. I think we'll be remiss if we don't mention our sister Hatun, uh, who brought this to light, actually, uh, 2016, I believe. Correct? She, well, she and I put brought it uh, put it into uh, up up at Speaker's Corner. She was the one that actually collected these. In fact. To, to, truth be told, I didn't even consider this to be that important. And when she started collecting this, I kind of poo-pooed it. And I said, Hatun, the better stuff is Dan Brubaker's material, the manuscript material. Is, uh, and she says, Jay, you're being an academic. You're not being a Muslim. Let, believe me, this is much more damaging. Right. And so she had to sit me down and correct me on this. She said, every Muslim, it doesn't matter where they are in the world, whether they are radical, whether they are nominal, possibly not the liberals, they have always been told, since they were yay high to a grasshopper, that the Quran is one that the Quran has always been preserved, that there is no there is no difference between the Quran we have today, the Hafs Quran that you see, the little blue one up there, and that which was given to Muhammad, that which was revealed uh, at, at between 610 and 632, that which was then canonized by Uthman in 652, that which exists in heaven on the eternal tablets. She said every Muslim is drilled into that. And the reason why is because no one can change the Quran because there must not be any human intervention. And that's why she's been told her father uh, was a well-known, respected cleric there in Turkey, and he has always said there's no difference between, there's not one word that is different, there's not one letter that is different. Many of them even go as far as to say there's not even one dot that's different. Yasef Qadi has been quoted over and over again as saying every word, every letter is exactly the same in the Quran we have today as that which is in heaven. The reason they have to say that is because the Quran makes that claim itself. So they've got to support the Quranic claim. They've got to support this idea that this is unfettered by human hands, that has no human intervention. And because of that, of that fact, they have to support they have to do so publicly, especially publicly. So suddenly, when we hold up 26 of them, went down to Speaker's Corner, I didn't expect the reaction we got. I wasn't expecting that kind of reaction. I, um, there was Mansur Ahmad, who's a, who has been there for about 20 years at Speaker's Corner, and he said, "This, so, so what? These are nothing more than the pronunciation. This yeah. is nothing more than recitations. And Jay, imagine you met me and I was still a Muslim and you told me about these seven different Qurans. I would have laughed at you. I said, they're all the same. They're one and the same Quran. I don't see any problem. Yeah, and so that's why, I, 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 and to me, I didn't really think that we'd get this kind of reaction. And it was because Ma Muhammad Hijab was there in the crowd, and we filmed them. That's the nice thing about having smart ca cameras, and there was about 20 cameras there that day filming us. And his reaction was to pull all the Muslims away, to get them out of there. And so you can see him telling all the Muslims to leave. Now, he's a tall guy, six foot six. So he stands out, and there he is with his beard. He's a lot thinner then than he is today. And he's saying, get away, get away. Do not listen to this. Do not watch this. Do not listen to what they're saying. And he succeeded on the day. The problem is he succeeded getting the Muslims out. What he didn't succeed is answering it himself. He had no response to right. those people. Then said, well, what are these Qurans? He didn't know how to answer that. And for four years, this is, must, have been, have, must have been festering in his own mind because he doesn't have an answer. If he doesn't have an answer, who would have the answer? Well, let's go to Yasir Qadi. Yasir Qadi, considered to be one of the highest respected Muslim clerics. Uh, he's an academic. He got his doctorate at Yale University. Certainly, he would have an answer to this conundrum. And it is a conundrum. What are you going to do with these now 30 official Kirats. There's 30 of them. We only have seven, eight of them right here. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. These are the ones I just gotten in two weeks ago. Hatun had 26 of them. She's up to 37 now that she has been able to find. 37. I thought there was only 30 official ones. Ooh, that's another whole other conundrum. Nonetheless, right. but, but within, within the last intervening four years, he finally came to uh, his, well, his, his respected cleric, and he asked this question. After about an hour and 16 minutes of talking about other things that were not that interesting, he says, probably the biggest question that I want to ask, the most disturbing question, is this question about the kira. What should we do about these kira? And what was Yasir Qadi's reaction? He recoiled. You can see him on film. Absolutely. And he tried to weasel his way out of the whole discussion uh, over and over. And, over and again. He, he said, was, we do not talk absolutely. about this in public. This is not something you ask me on camera, and you do not bring it up in a 20-minute tw interview. And you could see he did not want, in fact, he went on to say, I have never, ever brought this up in public. In all the years I have taught, I have never talked about this. Why? Because this is something you must do a deep dive to understand. And I loved, he went to three different categories. And he said, there are those who are, who are, who are in, in initiates. Uh, these, are, I assume, are, must be converts or those who are young in, in their faith. We don't even mention this. You don't mention this to them. The intermediate students, we talk about it, but we say there's a line beyond which you don't go. You just don't ask certain questions. And he talked about the red line. We have 
we have a huge respect for the Quran, he says. Yeah. We yeah. don't go beyond this line. And what I want to say is uh, we are going live again, folks, at 5 p.m. New York Times, which is 10 p.m. UK time. Hopefully this time it will be announced so that uh, everybody is prepared. But I am suggesting that we show segments of these kind of things. I have some segments. You have some segments. I've got a seven-minute that overview that goes through all the major things right there in the seven minutes. We can show that. That'll be great. And I want to say is there is a possibility. There is a possibility David Wood will join us. So we will be talking next time about this topic that Jay has brought up, which is the discussion and the interview that took place between uh, Yasser Qadi and uh, Muhammad Hijab. And we are going to show segments. And I think we can even uh, show maybe something from uh, Shabira who addressed issues related to the Qur'an as well. I think Shabir Ali, and I thought at the time Yasser Qadi was actually being pretty honest. Absolutely, he then absolutely, said, he, he then was said, honest. Yeah. He said the third category are the advanced students. Take my class and you'll be in this third category. He kept on saying, take my class. I'm not gonna answer now, but take my class. And then you do a deep dive. And look what he said, we do a deep dive and then the problems begin to appear. Once you do this deep dive, the problems begin to appear. No kidding, and I was sitting there clapping when I heard that. Yeah. And I want to thank Colin, you know, at Islamic Critique. He was the one that actually got me onto this. I didn't know this stuff was even there. I didn't even know about this interview until Colin put it up there at his three minutes. And I said, goodness sakes, I've got to see this interview. And I just sat there laughing and clapping when I realized what these guys were admitting. And I said, finally, we have a Muslim scholar that's admitting what all of us already know, but no Muslim has dared to ever broach, and certainly not in public. And then I noticed that Muhammad Hijab was really getting quite upset. And when he says, we don't answer this question, it's not that, it's, you, it's too difficult. The, 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 this is something that you traditionalists, you traditionalists, you don't even yeah, understand. it's almost like Islam of the East versus Islam of the Islam West. Islam of the West. That's he was what saying. he was referring to. And know. he was. And yeah. he says, you don't realize that we in the West, the experts there, the Western experts, have gone, had huge leap now in understanding. And this huge leap and that you in the East, you, you, your narrative has holes in it. What a thing to say on camera. Yeah. has holes in it. But he is telling the truth, Jay. If you look at, for instance, the history of the Quran by Noldeki, okay, you are going to come across various traditions. Now, I mean, I'm going to say this. People think that there is only one tradition and that after the death of Muhammad, there was the war of the apostates. And <laughs> somebody's talking about killing apostates here. But yeah, I agree with you. Uh, there is a lot of us uh, out there. But nevertheless, apostates uh, left Islam. Uh, Abu Bakr waged the war, and supposedly many of the Hafaz or the memorizer of the Quran died. Um, you know, history says, uh, you know, there was a lot of them. I think there's about 70 of them, give or take. And all that to say is that Omar, Omar ibn al-Khattab, suggested basically that the Quran be collected first time. That's when he mentioned, uh, Jay mentioned Zayd ibn Thabit, who was actually nervous about doing something the Prophet himself did not do. That's the tradition that we hear. But do you know that there is various traditions just about this one? Some will suggest that there is another one, that Omar himself is the one that completed the job. Another one says that Omar is the one actually that put the idea out there and then Uthman took it from there. These are like three or four holes in this narrative. And he wasn't kidding when he talked about holes. <laughs> but here's another interesting hole in the narrative. And you mentioned something about it. Why in the world would you collect a Quran in writing and then keep it as a personal Quran and put it under your bed? Why? Look, if this is the greatest revelation in the history of mankind, if this was the one thing that Muhammad was sent to receive, and then you stick it and you give it to a, one of his wives, she leaves it on her bed for 20 years. I want to back up even more to something else that comes out. Remember we're told over and over again that, that Muhammad, when he received the Quran, I'm assuming he received it in a dialect he understood. And the dialect he would have understood would be the Qurayshi dialect, right? That's his dialect. Did he ever move outside of Mecca Medina? Or do we recall that he ever went up to uh, Basra or to Kufa? Do we know that he ever went up to Well, Damascus? I mean, the, again, the tradition that is backward, you know, reverse injury engineering says before he was a prophet, he might have went to these areas. Did he? Do we have I, any that's the question. Okay. When he went to this area, did he learn those dialects up there? Yeah, it will be amazing if he learned all of those dialects. Because what does he say to Jibril? According to, say, according to the tradition, it says that he asked Jibril My for, people. I, these people don't understand what I'm saying. Could you give it to me in and six other dialects? And he's talking about his people, so, meaning his surrounding areas, the tribes that he's familiar so with. So how many dialects existed in the Medina and Meccan era? Well, area? according to this tradition, there's only seven. Okay, now how many of these dialects do you find just in these seven that I have here? A lot. You have Damascus, you have Kufa, you Which have Which is Basra. outside of even Mecca and Medina. None of these are dialects that have anything to do with Mecca and Medina, except for Dafi and also except for Ibn Kathir. 
right? and then then Abu Jafar Nafi Medina not, Ibn Kathir Mecca and we're not and Abu Jafar yeah. that comes even later because he comes with Al Jazari and that's what he's yeah. not into he's not introduced till 1429 which is 15th century but can you understand how is it that Muhammad suddenly knew seven dialects how could he have known seven dialects if he didn't even travel to know these dialects and more than that are those the same dialects that we have here? No, these are yeah. much further afield, so these cannot be those seven that everybody suggests are the seven that Muhammad received. Absolutely. See, to that. talk about holes, that's a huge hole. More than that, if you're talking about different dialects and you're trying to, your Jibril is giving it so people can understand it, why don't they use the existing languages that exist in the seventh century? What are we now finding in western part in the Mediterranean, in the eastern part of the Mediterranean, the whole area that were, that most of the Arabs lived in? They would have been Byzantine, therefore they would have spoken Greek. In the part of Kufa and Basra, they would have not been Arab speakers. Those would be Persian. That's the sauce in that area. They would have spoken Persian. If you're talking over as far over in Egypt, they would have been Copts. They would have been learning Copts. So why did Jibril not give it in Copt and in Greek and in Persian? It's, it's just the whole thing is, is messy, uh, Jay. The whole thing is messy. And I hope that uh, next time at 5 o'clock when we do this, we will give a glimpse of these differences in dialect pronunciations that you and I will be dealing with. By the way, me and Jay have so far uh, recorded, I think, five or six of this particular series. Uh, Lord willing, uh, we hope to finish with 15, maybe 18 videos in this particular series. So, uh, you know, hold your horses. And uh, another thing uh, about holding your horses, well, David Wood just confirmed he will be with us at 5 p.m. Eastern Time. 5 p.m. Eastern Time, we'll do two radio segments, which is one hour live stream that will be split into two halves. And we can certainly talk about the holes in the narrative and this conundrum that was brought up back in June of this year. Um, what are the different areas that uh, we've intended uh, in this video series to investigate? We're going to do a number of things. We're going to start, first of all, the presuppositional problems that most every Muslim, and I would say Christians and almost everybody that's watching, starts the assumption that the traditions are correct, uh, that Al-Buhari, -Al Sahih Muslim, Ibn Daud, Tirmidhi, uh, uh, Tabari, and uh, Zamakshari, and all the others that come after him and Hisham earlier than that, and uh, and these that these traditions called the Sirah, the Hadith, the Tafsir, and the Tahrit, those four genres, that they are all correct. And if you believe that they are all correct, then you're going to have to try to understand the Qur'an the, the within those traditions, which is going to cause problem because there's a disconnect of 240 to 200 to 300 years. That's the right. first problem. I don't start from that presupposition. I'm assuming that all those uh, uh, those traditions that are introduced by Ibn Hisham in 833, uh, by Al Waqidi in 835, by, by Al Buhari in 870, 875, up until 923 when Al Tabari introduces his traditions, those are way, way too late, and they're too, too far away. They're hundreds of miles away, hundreds, mi hundreds of years too late. I want to go back to the seventh century, and I want to see what actually happens in the seventh century. So we're going to be—that's what we're introducing in this video series. We're looking and seeing what we actually know, what we can also see, actually see. So we're looking at two different centuries. We're starting in the seventh century. We're looking and see what the traditions say that happened in the seventh century, and we're showing the that later no, traditions are these saying later what happened earlier. The, and these are all redacted back, and we're saying that there That's is right. hole after hole after hole. They're getting the wrong person at the wrong place, doing the wrong thing at the wrong time, in the wrong language. And then we're going to go to the 8th century when these start to be introduced. These start to be introduced in 736, 738, 745, 770, 775, up until 905. Okay, these are these and the uh, well, I'm looking at also the Rawis. The Rawis are the two for each one of these readers. So we're talking about 30 of them. These get introduced between 736 and 905. They made chosen in 936 and 1429. So we're going to look at those two centuries and do a comparative. And we're going to show you that there's not just one or two little holes. There is hole after hole after hole after hole. And the reason why is people are not looking at a timeline. They're not looking at it on a timeline. We're going to show the timelines. And we're going to show you, look at the enormous amount of years that are intervening and how that this is contradiction after contradiction. You've got to ask the historical problem. Why? Because we as Christians have already done this to the Bible. We've already done this with the Bible. We have done all of these. We've done redacted criticism. We've done source criticism. We've done textual criticism. A textual criticism starts from the premise that at first and foremost, you open up the book and you read what's there. None of these anybody looked at. None of these anybody looked at the text. That's right. None of these compared text with text. Take a look at these two right here. I'm just going to show you these two right here. This is Warsh. Yeah, it says Warsh right there, and this is Hafs. 
Yeah. So these are two right here. Warsh two most popular. is more common in North Africa. Hafs is the majority of the Islamic world. This is the most common around the world because it's been canonical, canonized by King Fahd in 1985 for the whole world. This one is more popular, I just say, in North Africa. Just between these two right here. 5,000? 5,000 5, differences. 5,000 right. words and meanings and practices and beliefs. Are you hearing Shabir Ali? These do change the practice. These do change the beliefs. These do change the doctrine. And because of the fact that we're talking about 5,000 differences, just between two of them, and we're not only looking at 30 of them, we're just between two of them, I want to suggest that whoever chose Warsh, and remember, he was chosen not because of popularity, like all the others were chosen. He was chosen because of where he lived, geography, because he had terrible popularity. He had only a few strands that went from him. Not many people followed him. But because he lived in Egypt, he was chosen, though he should have been chosen for the Hijaz. Interestingly, we're going to show you that when you do textual criticism, you need to do what we did to the Bible. You always need to open the text, for heaven's sakes. And you, you need, need to, to have read a critical text. text, like the ASV, the, uh, the NASB. We have footnotes telling you. That's right. And things. what do they tell you? They go back to the earliest exactly. manuscripts. Exactly. And they exactly. look and see how they di are different. What, what has that ever been done with this book? When was that ever done with this book? And these books, by the way, uh, what fascinated me as a, an Arab reader is that on the margin, they're giving you ideas about the different dialects and readings. <laughs> they have no idea how that finally they're now seeing that these do not, uh, they, do, they don't even agree within the same cadre, within the same family, within the same stable. That's right. That's what's interesting. The fact that they are different names show that every one of them has a different reading. And that's why the 30 had to be chosen. They had to because there weren't just 30 Al-Fadi. There were as many as possibly seven to 800 of them. So, folks, buy as many Qurans as you can possibly can. Where can people go and buy it? Seriously. Actually, you can go up to Al-Quran and buy it. I got these seven. Al-Quran.com? Al-Quran.com. Al-Quran.com. There you go. You, you know. can get them right now. And I just got these. So they came. They sent to me from Illinois. They came to me for where I live. And I brought them down here to be in the studio with you. I had to I had to drive here to do so because they're so heavy. I couldn't take these on board the plane. And we're, we're thankful that you brought them with you because people uh, can see that uh, in, in a video. Many times they make fun and say, oh, that's just a photo well, there you go. This is not a Photoshop. We can touch them right here. And folks, do buy them up because I think sooner or later the Muslims are going to find realize that they don't want to sell these anymore. They don't want the world to know uh, of this conundrum. This is a hole. This is a huge hole that the, the narrative have not dealt with. And remember at the very end, how many times did Muhammad Hijab ask him, please, I want you to ask. Multiple times. Multiple times. I'm going to give you a Mus'haf, a black Mus'haf. What are you going to write there? Which one of these? is going to be on your hand. Which one? And what was his final answer? After 25 minutes of insisting, he finally says, all of them. A little bit of this, a little bit of that. You add this and you add all these up to and you get the Quran. Now remember, remember, Hatun's team in London has looked at only 23 of the 30. And how 20, many? How many? 93,000 differences. Repeat the number. 93? 93,263 93, at the last count. 93,000 differences and Yasser Qadi said, they're all the Quran. And folks, let me tell you why this is significant. I know some, some uh, by the way, Christians will push back and say, well, wait a minute. So what? You know, the, the Bible, we know we have different manuscripts and sometimes there is word here and word there. Maybe for you, it is okay for a Muslim who is brought up to believe that the Quran is perfectly preserved in heaven, on earth, and what you have today is the exact same Quran that was revealed to the Prophet of Islam 1400 years ago. To say there is one difference is a disaster. That's why Sister Hatun was surprised when she said, I want to buy a couple of Qurans. And, and the question was, which versions you want to buy? And she didn't know that there is such a thing. Absolutely. Now, in our Bible, I have a line right here. Mark chapter 16, verse 9, there's a line there. What does it say there? The earliest manuscripts and some other ancient witnesses do not have Mark chapter 16, verse 9 to 20. But folks, we're transparent about it. Go to our website by John Snap. He does an excellent job proven to you that this is actually existed in the original Bible. So even we can refute things like this, and we're not afraid of dealing with these issues. Why can't Yasser Qadi, for instance, have a website and deal with these Why polls? is it that Yasser Qadi and Shabir Ali didn't even do this homework? Why is it that they didn't look at this? Why is it that every one of these variants we've had to find, our teams have had to find in Australia and in Britain and here in the United States? Why is it Westerners are having to actually do the work that the Muslims have, who, have had the, who have had these Qurans for 12 to 1300 years? Notice I'm not saying 1400. 12 to 1300 years, they've had these for over a thousand years. Why haven't they done this homework? 
Exactly. And by the way, I meant James uh, Snap. I said uh, uh, John Snap. Well, brother, um, you know, we have a couple of minutes left. Uh, I want to uh, thank you, Jai, uh, James E. Snap. Um, uh, I want to thank everyone, of course, for being here with us in such a short notice. And we're really blessed to see that many of you. By the way, I don't want to make any any promises, but we have a cool system that it is quite possible that we will go live on my Facebook page, on YouTube channel, my YouTube channel, Sir International, and possibly also on Fonder Films all at the same time. We're working towards that. I don't want to make any promises. Don't tell Jay that I'm making promises like this. Otherwise, well, you just told me. So what's the promise you're making? <laughs> Uh, so I want to thank everyone. By the way, uh, like I said, uh, David Wood is going to be with us at 5 uh, p.m. Uh, New York time. Uh, I told the brother if he cannot stay with us the whole hour, it's okay. He can stay with us for as long as he can possibly can. And we are going to uh, probably show a couple of clips of these kind of issues that we addressed so far uh, in terms of the interview between uh, Yasser Qadi, uh, Hijab, Muhammad Hijab, and possibly even something or clips from uh, Shabir Ali's talk. Uh, Islam Critique, and by the way, Islam Critique, bring your checkbook with you when you come back. Uh, Islam Critique is uh, asking a very uh, good question. He's saying, do you believe there is an issue, uh, a hole in the tradition that the Uthmanic collection did even take place? Absolutely. I don't think there was any such thing as an Uthmanic tradition. This is all from the 9th and 10th century. The Islam, the whole idea of Uthman is introduced in seven, I mean, in, in uh, 870. 870 is 240 years too late. I can I would say there is no such person as Uthman. There, in fact, we can't find any reference to Abu Bakr, Umar, Uthman, or Ali. The first caliph that we find any reference for is Muawiyah, 661. But that's for another time. That's for another place. Islamic critique. Wait, if I'm going to be talking about that, I've got to change my shirt back to my green shirt because of my green uh, shirt. Oh I can yeah. Talk about that. Uh, apparently, Jay has traditions uh, based on the color of his shirt. Uh, test him out on that. Uh, the I'm color the wrong color for this. The discussion. color green is for what? It's for the seventh century debunks. And the, the color century. maroon? No, the brown color is for the Quran. Brown color for the Quran. The yellow? I don't have a yellow yet. I'm what what about the leather vest? Leather vest is for when I'm cold. <laughs> Very good. Well, thank you uh, so much, everyone. Uh, again, this is uh, part of my podcast, Let Us Reason. In case you're interested in knowing where you find my podcast, you can go to our website, sirainternational.com. We have a section in there that has the archive for the last six years. And uh, you can also go to um, uh, different platforms like SoundCloud, like uh, Omni Studio. I, I was even told that iTunes has it. So, yes, uh, Homeboy has been busy for years uh, doing radio, and now we're doing videos and YouTube. I do things in Arabic. Uh, praise the Lord. Yesterday we recorded a number of Arabic videos, uh, lessons basically from the Bible. The, the goal and the dream is to do an entire journey from the Bible cover to cover, every book in there in Arabic so that it can help those who are apostates of Islam and followers of Jesus who are in areas that they cannot access the Bible freely. Praise the Lord for the internet. And that's why we are so thankful that uh, uh, both Muhammad Hijab and Yasser Qadi deleted their sections because we have copies of them already. And what a beauty it is. Any last Thoughts. Yeah, some people have been asking where you can get these different Qur'an. You can get them on alquran.com. A-L-Q-U-R-A-N dot C-O-M. Go up and buy them now. Get them now before they're yeah. completely out, sold out. And I will put the link for you also on both the description for this uh, YouTube channel and also on the Facebook uh, page. Thank you, everyone. Uh, we appreciate your time, uh, Dr. J. And uh, we'll come back again to doing the normal recording. We'll see all of you at 5 p.m. New York Times, which is 10 p.m. London time. We'll try our best to try to announce it if we're successful this time, but keep that time at least uh, handy and hope to see you all. Invite as many people as you can possibly do. Thank you and God bless.